Hello and welcome back to Box Podcast, the weekly pseudo academic roundtable of pop culture analysis with drinking and swearing. My name is Christopher Maverick, but you can call me Mav, and I am once again here with my co-host, Katya Gorecki. How's it going? You know, uh, um, quarantine, uh, twiddling my thumbs, um, <laughs> watching reruns of RuPaul's Drag Race still, uh, and, uh, also watching new episodes, because that's the thing that we do now. Okay. Um, yeah. Contemplating the eternal weirdness that is, you know, 2020 with bangs. I have been grading papers, lots and lots of papers. The semester started up again, so now I'm teaching again. And I both love and hate. Teaching would be so much better without all the grades. So for anybody who's in college or, or school of any kind, you're like, I hate my teacher because he hates me because he's just grading. He doesn't hate you. Grading no, we just sucks. hate grading. Yeah. <laughs> enjoy reading papers because I'm a giant nerd and it's like oh cool ideas you had thoughts good job yeah the whole like I have to quantify them and like even when you're not like bringing them in relation to each other just like the fact that like oh somebody got a B versus somebody got a B plus it's like it just I don't know yeah if I could just like write A on everything and be done that would be so much better right or just like you did you did acceptable like and you did well enough that this is this you've made progress like yeah. because as data shows, grades don't actually motivate anybody. But people like looking at them because they like numbers and, and you can make we like and stuff we on like them. knowing that we're doing well. You know, it's a nice uh-huh. it's like it's like it's like a it's like a meaningless way of positioning yourself in the universe. Ultimately is not a helpful metric of anything substantive. But if you know, if if you're doing well it makes you feel good, and I guess if you're not doing well, it probably doesn't. And there's the transition. <laughs> because, because, well, no, because so I'm, I've been doing a bunch of grading, and I've been working on my dissertation, and I had a whole bunch of quantifiable data that I had to talk about, and I inexplicably got really excited when I was working on a part of my paper, and I was like, "Ooh, I get to use a chart here. This is awesome!" And I was like talking about it on Facebook, and I, I don't know, I was pleased about weird, stupid stuff because I am a giant nerd. There's also charts of fun. Yeah, well, yeah, charts are pie charts. Pie charts, are, pie charts are my personal favorite. No, well, mm-hmm. I hate pie charts. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna keep, but see, but I wrote a whole blog about it, about like how I was just like thinking about some of the stuff that that I was thinking about while I was working on the charts for my dissertation, and how I used to like actually make charts professionally, oddly enough. And then I was like, well, we should do a show on this. We should do a show on visualization of data. So that's what we're going to talk about. It's it, it's it is a weird pop culture thing because I think we live in this world right now where charts are like super popular. They show up in like everything from USA Today to just like memes on like Facebook and Twitter and shit. And like so I really just wanted to talk about charts and and you know why people like them and what makes a good chart and a bad chart. So I invited people. Um <laughs> I invited several people this time. Uh well first I want to, I guess, technically the first time you've been on the show, you were supposed to be on once before and technology dropped you off. So I'd like to welcome Andrew DeMond to the show. Hey, Andrew. Hey, thank you for having me. Yeah. Again. And, you can, <laughs> and we can hear you this time. This is awesome. That's yeah. Perfect. Andrew, I talked to you about this because you, well, you made several charts that like, Tell people what you do first so that I can, so that the chart thing will make sense. So I am a comic scholar at the University of Waterloo, St. John's campus. And my large project is data driven. So rather than just reading comics, we gathered a whole bunch of really intense focused data on those comics. And then we read comics. Mm -hmm. And so the project's larger than just the Twitter feed, but like you're probably. I'm most popularly known for the Twitter feed. Is that fair? <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> so the, Clare- the Claremont Project has this Twitter feed where uh, Chris-, Chris Claremont is a comic book writer. And this is not a comic book episode, but um, there you go. There's your, your weekly comic book content for, for the show. But Chris Claremont is a famous comic book writer who wrote X-Men for... What? 16 consecutive 16. years. 16 consecutive years and some shoot-off comics. But like for 16 years, he writes X-Men. So you took everything he did and dumped it into a database and you talk about it on, on the Twitter feed and elsewhere in the project, but like you talk about it in the Twitter feed and then every once in a while on the Twitter feed, you will randomly say, let's look at all the times that Wolverine got punched versus when he got kicked versus whatever, or times when Rogue's costume ripped. And you like sometimes publish these as charts and I care. 
<laughs> this, excites, <laughs> this excites me for weird, geeky reasons. Um, are they more popular than other posts or no? I don't know. It's a really diverse group. Like we, we do have a good following in the data viz community at this point. Mm-hmm. Like I hear, I hear from them and they're like, this is cool. I can't wait to make charts out of this. Right. And that's, that was one <laughs> of my old fun. jobs. I used, I used to work for a company that was famous for data visualization and I worked with, among other people, Mike Higgins, who's also on the show today. Hey, Mike. Hi there. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so Mike said we used to work together. We went to college together too, but we used to work together at a company called Maya Design where among other things, we made charts for a living for, well, I mean, you were there longer than me. I worked there for four and a, four and a half years making charts um, and other stuff. <laughs> My job was not simply making charts, but, but you made charts for a long time there and you've gone on to make charts for another company. Yeah. So I, I mean, I guess technically we actually made software to make charts. Like uh, we both worked on this uh, interactive visualization and collaboration tool that uh, mm-hmm. later became like a government DOD, like software thing for the military. And then I started a company to do uh, to do visualization online uh, for nonprofits and the environmental community. Then we realized we couldn't make a lot of money doing that, uh, so we shifted over to the the media industry. Uh, and so we worked with the media industry for quite a while. Uh, and then we got bought by uh, Nielsen, the uh, media measurement company. You probably know them as the TV ratings people, but mm-hmm. they measure a lot more stuff than that. And so now I am. Uh, the uh, principal tech strategist for media analytics at mm-hmm. Nielsen. Mm-hmm. So that's my big title. Uh, Which and, is making charts. Well, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, but you can you you earn more money if you call it data science. So ah. but, but, yeah. that's fancy charts. That's data science, career <laughs> disease making yeah. charts. Yep. <laughs> and also at the at the last minute, we had a volunteer to be on the show. Uh, so, yeah, I, I kind of like volunteered once again yeah. to be on the show. <laughs> uh, my wife Stephanie, who's been on the show many times. Thanks before. for letting people, me be on the show. People recognize her voice. Um, Steph has an open invitation to just sort of yeah, be and, here because she lives in the house where my studio is. So she'll say, "What are you doing today?" And I tell her. And sometimes she's like, "I want to do that one." So <laughs> yeah, and I feel like surprisingly, like I feel like I need to be around people, which is like for me weird. So. So this kind of like sort of fills that need. And Oh, you're talking about like in COVID times. Yes, in COVID <laughs> times, yes, which is why I've been binging the, the show community because of the community <laughs> aspect of that show. So this is plus I do research, like I do use data in my research too. Yeah. So I'm not completely Steph as a cognitive psychologist and do education research and we develop educational technology. And so obviously we use we um assess that in classrooms with students and use that information to drive changes to further. So every once in a while, when I need, need to make a chart for a blog or for comic research and stuff, this has actually happened several times, I will like tabulate a bunch of data. I'll go through and I'll just like make an Excel spreadsheet. Mm-hmm. And then I, I go over to Stephanie and I go, make this make sense, please. And I you know run 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 data analysis and she'll say, well, what do you want me to do? And I said, I don't know, analyze it. And then she'll come up with something interesting. And then that sometimes works its way into my paper. Yeah, I, I love data. <laughs> so, and, and math and statistics. So. Yeah, nerd. Um, so, <laughs> so anyway. Are you aware of what show you host? Matt? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. But I, I mean, I, I hope people can tell that I'm excited about this because, you know, we do so many shows about yeah, let's talk about like superheroes or something. And, you know, there's, a, you know, Andrew's here. So there's it's a little bit of a tie in there. We, you know, we talk about TV a lot. Mike's here. And again, do you even work on the TV stuff? Technically, you work for the TV people, Mike. But do you even do TV stuff? Uh, yeah, I do. And okay. I, I mean, if we have a chance to talk about it, uh, we've got a we've got a really cool project that I think you would be interested in apart from the charts. Okay. Uh, but but we've been doing um, the, one of the things I'm working on a ton is called uh, inclusion analytics, where we're mm-hmm. trying to measure uh, diversity and representation of mm-hmm. TV programs, and then comparing that to like audience data comparing that to uh to you know the normal population and just seeing like do people say like to see people who look like them on screen does it not Mm -hmm. matter to them what how do the different networks the different platforms the different you know streaming services compare to each other in how good they are at, at different kinds of representation. So that's a that's a project I'm working on a lot right now. And uh, there are quite a few charts involved. 
So that came up. I'm going to bring Steph in here because that came up when when I was coming up with the idea for this episode, um, and I was talking about just the way data is used. And I was looking at um, I was looking at a chart by a uh, or a chart, an article with lots of charts by a woman named Amanda Shindra, and that's linked on the blog and in the show notes where she analyzed representations, male versus female representations of comic book superheroes um, over 50 years. Um, it's a really expansive project that was really interesting. And I was mm-hmm. talking with Stephanie about, I don't know what TV show we were talking about, but we were talking about numbers spoken lines by female characters versus male oh, characters. Oh, Cats. We were watching Cats. Oh, we, yeah, yeah, we were watching, yeah, we were watching the musical Cats. Which is wonderful and delightful, and if you're if you don't think so, you're wrong. It's okay. great. <laughs> it's gonna cause tension. Here. Cat. But just, uh, anyway, so we were watching cats with stuff like this is awful, and and okay, I know cats is awful. I, again, I, okay, we, we've talked about that on the show before. I, I adore cats. I know it's not good. <laughs> I've loved it since I was seven. I, it, it was never good. But um, but Steph walked in while I was watching it, and she was like, how come the women never say anything? And I was like, but they do. But she wasn't noticing. At the part in which I, we, I was watching, it was a male solo, so she wasn't noticing anything. And then she was wondering what the, you know, percentage of spoken lines in the in the play, but I don't remember if I was watching the play version or the film. I know I watched the play Broadway production back to back with the film production one day, so I don't remember which you walked into. It was the Broadway production. I was watching the Broadway. Okay, so um, mm-hmm. like, she was wondering about the percentage, and and she was like, "Well, you know, we could go the rink out." And I was like, "Well, that is a thing people actually do." Uh, and I recommended that she try to do she do a paper at PCA where she did a study like that. It's something that people do sometimes is they'll look at analytics mm-hmm. of you know what is the gender representation based on literal speaking roles now it's got a there's a problem with it cuz it's not always perfect my example is always little mermaid where the main female character has fewer lines in that movie than anybody else because the entire point of the movie is that she lost her voice right so she so she artificially has fewer lines even though she's in like every scene because but she's expressive obviously but Technically, you can't count her lines because she'll end up with fewer than the male character because most of the movie is him saying, I don't know what you're saying and her trying to act it out. Right. So there so there are are examples like that. But then I pointed at where Gina Davis, the actress, basically um, or Gina Davis Institute, Institute for Gender and Media. She's basically started an academic project where she does this kind of research and she publishes her results um, frequently. So there is a thing there. And then the Davis Institute always has really interesting looking charts on it, too. So so this is the kind of, you know, data visualization, data representation stuff that just seems fascinating to me because, I mean, it's weird. It's the it's the intersection of pretty art and nerdy numbers. And if you're enough of a nerd in a very specific way. I think it becomes interesting and also useful because like, you know, Steph, this is your actual job, right? Like you do this kind of analytic data and you could just dump it to a boring pie chart or something, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I mean, that's the kind of thing I was wondering from you, Steph, because uh, that's what Andrew does. Like Andrew will take that kind of tabulated data and then I, I made the Wolverine one up, but I think you actually did do the rogue one. Right, Andrew? Of the Yeah, we did instances of um, clothing being torn as part of a broader coding because we know that that's a way that women are frequently sexualized in comics. Right, right. And, the, and then you presented the chart and I was like, score. Awesome. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I know I'm supposed to like really be excited when you post the sexy pictures of the half naked woman with the cool, you know, Rogue is a sexy character in comics. And, but like, that's not the part that I thought was cool. I get a bar chart. Where, where you know where he where he showed <laughs> visualization of her outfits over time from like 1985 through 1997. I was like, oh, that's that's the stuff right there. Um, but, <laughs> so Steph, but you, I mean, you are. What do you do when you make one? Um, well, I mean, I usually we usually look at various types of data. Um, I don't know how relevant this is going to be to this discussion, but usually we look at just measures of learning, sort of just like very um, direct translation from what we're supposed to, we're trying to teach to what they're getting, they're gaining. So factual knowledge. Then we try to get um, measures of more um, deeper learning. So transfer, can they apply what they learn to different situations? Can they apply it to like like a month later? Are they still going to remember this? So yeah, we, we try to triangulate, I guess, and make sure that they are, you know, learning all, all these like different dimensions of, of learning. And then if not, then obviously we have to go in and try to. Right. But you write like a 30 page paper about that. 
that, right? Yes. And then, well, yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. And then you put like a chart on it so that people actually pay attention to it. That was my point. Yes, <laughs> many, many charts. There, there are lots of charts. But it's what grabs people's attention. Yes. 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 You made a good point there. But like you make the chart to get people's attention. Right. I think when you're thinking about this chart making, um, you, you kind of, you have to ask yourself a question, which is, Okay, am I trying to understand the data? Like, I'm the scientist, I've got the data in front of me, I don't know what the patterns are, I don't know what the story is that I want to tell yet, and I've got to figure that out. So I'm going to use visualization to help me understand that data and, and, and get that. Or do I know what the story is already? And now what I want to do is explain it to somebody else. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. I think you, it's a different process. Right. Because like the first one is the sort of exploratory visualization where you want to try out. You, you want to look for correlations. You want to look slow, for slow or down. You need to. Know. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to look for structure in that data. And then maybe, you know, if you're if you're fancy like Steph, you know, you're probably actually going to run statistical tests and things like that to see if the stuff you think you're seeing in the picture actually is borne out by the data. But then like There's a t-test. That's a word <laughs> I, that I know from living with Steph that I don't actually I can't actually do by myself. Yes. But but it's a thing. Yeah, yes. <laughs> that, that, is, that, is, that is definitely a thing. Yep. And uh but but then you know at some point right you're gonna turn around and this is especially true like in the business world and you're gonna you wanna convince the pointy haired boss to invest in something, right? Or you wanna you wanna make a point to the media industry that they should be like maybe hiring black producers because they don't have enough representation or, or whatever, right? Like, so, so now you want to tell a story and you want to punch it up, but you also kind of want to make it simple for them because they aren't necessarily going to know how to read like a box and whisker diagram or a radar chart or something super complicated, right? Like, so, so it's got to be simple and it's got to be colorful and it's got to be like punchy. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that's an important thing to, to ask yourself when you're thinking about how do I make this chart? I, I agree. And, and, and I think that you just made something I hadn't really thought about, but I think that's absolutely true. There are the two, are, are, is the audience yourself or is the audience, you know, the audience, right? Like there, and, and those are, and, and I'm, and yes, I realize the audience might be, is your audience scientists? Is your audience business people? Is your audience just random readers of USA Today? Is your audience my friends on Facebook, right? Like those are different things. But I think you're, that's a, that's a very key point. Like what is the purpose of, of the visualization, right? And, and it probably varies. Cause Steph, you, you would say you're making them for yourself. Like if you're, if you're doing, or at least every no, time I've seen not, you not do necessarily. analysis, you're doing it to figure out. Yeah, yeah, I do it for myself. I make lots and lots of graphs as I'm looking at the data initially, mm -hmm. like Mike said, to try to understand the data for myself. But then ultimately, you're trying to tell a story with the data, right? You want to show the most important mm -hmm. visual representation of what the main point you're trying to make with your study. Like you design some great uh, software that helps students to integrate information on their own, which students usually don't do because, you know, they, they tend to read and just kind of like learn verbatim. But um, so then you want to show like how great your product is with like soft with like a nice and Mike, Mike's uh, point about making it as simple as possible, I think is very important too. And that's kind of a mistake that I've made in the past is making kind of like complex interact uh, interactions shown on graphs that people can't really easily understand. So yeah, you it's kind of like, yeah, you want to present the data that shows your main point in the simplest way possible at the end. That's the I, I think that's the ultimate goal. But along the way, like Mike said, you do a lot of data representation to help you understand what's going on. If you want a tip, uh, start with a scatter plot. Scatter plots are super useful and uh, really good for finding correlations. Uh, mm -hmm. and I guess also spurious correlations. But yeah, like if you're doing that data science work to figure stuff out, just make shitloads of scatter plots and you will learn a hell of a lot really, really fast. Mm -hmm. Because you're looking for you're looking for groupings is which are, um, we should I mean before we go too far I do want to make a note because you know both Mike and I have sort of made the joke already and when we first started Katya you said you know I love pie charts and we're like yeah pie charts now again Mike and ah, I it's you know, like you, the same reason I always pick Godzilla movies for <laughs> the film thing it's not because they're actually useful uh -huh. because they're fun. Uh -huh. 
But we should talk about them a little bit because, you know, Mike and I come from, I mean, we literally together, right? So we come from very much the same school. I guess and we literally went to school together. So we, we come from the same school of learning where it comes to that. But we should talk about why we don't like pie charts and why, because I do I, want to figure out, we don't like them. And yet they're probably one of the most popular charts that are used in media. So, so 80% of why we don't like them is that we're snobs, right? And we definitely want to be cooler than you are. And uh-huh. since normal people like pie charts, we, we can't like pie charts because they're just too popular, right? Uh, but no, I mean, pie charts are good for basically one thing, which is showing a simple proportionality, right? Like you've got one variable and you want to say X percent of this is accounted for by whatever, right? So my rule of thumb is if your pie chart has like essentially more than one wedge in it, you probably don't want to use a pie chart because people are kind of bad at interpreting angular distance. And you often see these pie charts with like 20 slices in them. And you can't tell the relative sizes (laughs) of those slices. So then they stick labels on them. So now what you've done is build a data table that's shaped in a circle, right? Like that's all you did. And it's hard to read and it's hard to understand. Uh, But, you know, people, people do like them. The other thing about pie charts is because they're so popular, they show up often. You see people doing really, I don't know how they manage this, but like they'll, they'll have pie charts where, you know, the percentages add up to more than a hundred percent or, or they're, they're mislabeled so that the small slice has the big number and you just, you, you, it, it, it's baffling. I, I, I literally don't know how people manage to do this because if you use software to build your thing, right, the software will stop you from making those obvious mistakes. But I guess people are hand drawing pie charts in PowerPoint or something. And so much work. Yeah. Well, yeah. Just, why would you yeah. do that? Them in, why? Is it, do they learn them in school and just keep using them? Like, what? <laughs> where's the origin of this <laughs> abomination? I mean, they've always existed, but I, re- I really think it's USA Today, right? Like, USA Today yeah. mm. became super famous mm. in, like, the 80s for, like, suddenly, like, super, USA Today really sort of popularized the chart. Oh, maybe it's just a, sa- a space-saving thing. Yeah. And well, they they were. I mean, they were a newspaper that suddenly just started. They started doing it on every issue. There was just some kind of mm-hmm. a bunch of charts on the front page of you know, here's the stock market right now, or here's what happened in the Super Bowl yesterday, or here's sports scores. And they were just dumping these charts on everywhere in four colors because it was pretty and it caught attention to them because nobody else was doing it. And I think that they're really, like Mike said, they're easy to understand from a very basic level, right? Like I can. If a chart only has four items, I can tell that this wedge is biggest and this wedge is smallest, and that's fine. On the other hand, USA Today sort of quickly graduated away from doing that to doing like weird graphics. Like, I want to show the gross the gross GDP of two countries, so I'll have a little tiny dollar, giant dollar, right? Like they started doing stuff like that, which kind of ultimately is more useful. Like when we work together. Steve Roth, who's a person that nobody knows except for me and Mike, but it's a guy that we used to work with. He used to say the reason our product was never going to have a pie chart application was because anything that you could represent with a pie chart could be better done with a stacked bar chart. And yeah. he's he's right. Like there's no there's no reason for them to exist. Is there then ever a good use for a pie chart other than making really bad jokes about pie? Means oh yeah. Oh my my joke about pie was awesome. I have my <laughs> well no, but uh, yeah, it, they work on memes. Yeah, they work, they, they, they work in, you know, they're really interesting for, it's sort of like, I think, pie charts and Venn diagrams, right? Mm. Which Venn diagrams are not, they're not quantitative. They're just sort of a, yeah. it's a visualization that people like. And it's really easy to like sort of make one and then toss it on a meme on the internet, which is the only way that information means anything today is, can you know, can I, can I tweet it? And I think that that's fun, you know, like I can toss this on Instagram and everybody gets it and everybody reshares it. And if I'm lo- and if I'm doing something just for likes, which is, you know, the currency of, of life today, that's useful, 
I guess. Uh, I mean, I, I still think like if you have a if you have a single number like a percentage, and you want to present that percentage in a more visually interesting way than just writing forty two percent in big bold type, a uh, pie chart's fine, <laughs> right? Like uh, you're still you're still going to have to label it forty two percent in big bold type, but you know, but it'll work more simple. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> just just here's the. Promise me, never make a 3D pie chart. Oh, no, those are, it. those are gross. <laughs> like, I don't like oh, those. No. Those are, those are like a spherical chart. I did one of the graphic for this just because I knew. Ah. I, but I knew I wanted it to. I mean, I was making a joke. I knew I was making fun of it when I did it. Um, no, those are just annoying. Even I, who appreciates the pie chart for like whimsy reasons, is, no, those are just no. Uh, Andrew, you, I mean, you, like I said, you've used them a lot on Claremont. Look, um, the Claremont run is Andrew's project's Twitter feed um, that I will probably reference a couple times. So, but you've used a lot of bar charts there. And why, why did you settle on that as like sort of the way to do it? Oh man, that's, that's a tough question. I think I'll answer by apologizing in that I'm an English major. <laughs> so I think, I, so I'm bad at stats and I'm bad at data viz, but more importantly, I tend to think in terms of rhetoric mm-hmm. because that's one of my own disciplines. So we go back to our Aristotle and we think about the rhetorical triangle, right? The idea of ethos, pathos, and logos. When we think of charts and graphs, we tend to think that they're an instrument of logos, right? But they're not. They're clearly all three. Uh, you've got ethos generating credibility, which is a thing that obviously they do just to their inclusion. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about comics. I'm a low-life academic swindler, but I have a chart now, so... <laughs> Respectability. So you, you've made funny books respectable is what you're saying. <laughs> exactly. And then pathos, like, I'm, I'm sure Mike can talk about this better than I can, but like charts and graphs always lie. They can't not lie. That idea of truth is impossible. Even your choice of color is going to create pathos. It's going to impact someone mm-hmm. emotionally and color their reception of the data. So I try to think, keep things um, relatively simple. And I try to present the data in a way that is innocent, but aesthetically pleasing. But I fully recognize that, again, I'm always distorting just through the simple act of using these things, even though, of mm-hmm. course, like, even when I interpret something, I'm distorting just as much when I write an essay. So it all kind of levels off, I guess. Yeah, that, that distortion thing, though, I mean, I think like, uh, like the word distort is, um, you know, it comes with a, a tone, right? Like it's, it's kind of a pejorative uh, uh, word, right? And I think there's definitely, there's, there's information visualization mistakes you can make that distort the data in a way where you are clearly lying, right? Like you are, you are misrepresenting mm-hmm. the truth of the data, possibly accidentally, but maybe deliberately, right? Like uh, to, to tell a story that isn't supported by the data. But then there's a different kind of distortion, mm-hmm. which I think is, is, is emphasis, right? In, in, in that you are trying to draw your audience's attention to what you b- believe is the significant or salient uh, feature uh, of the data that, that you want to shine a spotlight on. And I think that kind of distortion, if you will, is not only justified, but crucial, right? right. Like, uh, you, can't, you can't communicate effectively if you're not doing that. Right, you can't simplify. Right, that's, like the, I mean, that's the basis of communicating any kind of information at all, I think, regardless of like method. It's mm-hmm. like... There, there's no such thing as like knowledge that can be shared among human beings that isn't in some way like subjective or I guess we would use the word distorted because like a we're limited human beings with limited faculties and limited understanding so there's automatically some information lost there and then I think that's right it's like in order for something to make sense in a context in which we're sharing it like emphasis is important like even when you're trying to be as objective as possible there's still an, like you're you're always interpreting something whenever you're sharing information at some level. Mm-hmm. There's, there's better ways and worse ways of doing it that are more like more honest or not. I mean, I think that's like not like I think that's like ninety percent of learning how to be a researcher is what are the better ways of interpreting information and what are the worse ways. Right, reducing the static. Yeah, and, and that's why you you can't just present data or the um, the chart alone in my profession anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to and you have to accompany it with statistical tests and also error bars so you can interpret the data. You can't just say, this is greater than this. You have to say at a probability level of less than 0.001 or something like that. So you give them the yeah. full information. I mean, even in English, well, like, that, that's, that's right. the purpose of citation too. It's like, so some, someone can go back and look at the original source material yeah. and make their own judgment based off of 
<laughs> their information. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of one of the things I'm wondering. I, so if you go back to like our news by meme episode, right? Which we did. Wow. I was going to say we did. I almost said like a couple of years ago. It was at the very beginning of the, of the pandemic. So it was literally ago. less than a year. Yeah. It, yeah, it was less than a year ago. But it's like dog years. Like sometime in the 70s, we did this episode <laughs> of the show <laughs> like, um, where we talked about like how people get their news by a headline, right? You read the meme and news stories are often very clickbaity because they're trying to get you to come through. But most people just sort of read the headline and they move on. And I think a chart is a... Yeah, I know. Um, a, chart, oh, okay. a, a chart is a way of like sort of drawing some eyeballs to it. And so I'm looking at like Andrew's project Twitter feed, right? And the most recent post as of time of recording is about number of holdings in the WorldCat library of various trade paperbacks of X-Men comic books. Now, obviously, because of what your project is, you probably have a lot of geeky comic book fans who read it. There's nothing comic book <laughs> about this whatsoever. This is literally Andrew geeking out about very specific weird library data <laughs> you know it could have been anything but like it's pretty so like i think that draws its attention to it right so like <laughs> yeah. and, and, and that goes to like I, like i'm thinking of um i've seen people posting things as proof that that i know are completely lies right i've seen people posting breitbart charts that say well, this proves that COVID is a myth, or this proves that that um, that systemic racism is a myth. Cops don't really shoot, you know, pe- black people more than white people. I know because I've got this here chart, but it's you know, it's not real. But they they believe it because you know someone to put someone spent the time to make a very colorful chart. I saw one where where a guy was like, well, you know, um, you know, ninety seven percent of white people are killed by black people, and ninety seven percent of black people are killed like by black people. And he had a graph that showed that, and I'm like, that's not real. And they're like, how do you know? And I'm like, because the vast majority of people who are killed in America are literally killed by a member of their immediate family, like wife, husband, child, parent, who typically are of the same race, so therefore it can't be 97%. Like, there are people who are who have interracial families, but like, I, like, without looking it up, I know this chart's false. But they believed it, and it just gets you know, all these forwards because chart, chart means real. You know, so, mm-hmm. that's the ethos that Andrew's talking about. It's the lie. It's the lie of credibility because... It has surface features of sci- being scientific data. Yes. And- yeah, it, well, because yep. science means graphic. Yep. Graphic, yep, that's <laughs> no. a scientific thing. Yeah. <laughs> now, there is another side to this, though. So, my project is in the humanities, right? Mm-hmm. I have had direct, very powerful people that I wanted to like my project for, like, reasons, uh, tell me that the reason they don't like my project is because it has quantitative data, as if I've, like, betrayed the humanities oh, yeah. creed or something yeah. like that. Yeah. By like psychology too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like there's yeah. a really rigorous divide between STEM and arts when it comes to research methodology. And like we have a mm-hmm. lot of data on even the difference between politics in STEM and arts, with STEM skewing far more right uh, and obviously humanity skewing far more left. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's mm-hmm. massive. And adopting the methodology of one, or even just incorporating the methodology of one when you're in the other, is like a huge challenge. It's a massive roadblock. And, and anyone who's been in the academy knows that interdisciplinarity is a buzzword. Mm -hmm. Nobody actually (laughs) wants it. Nobody actually supports it. I want it. That's why we have this show. (laughs) (laughs) This is another rant of mine, but like interdisciplinary, like interdisciplinarity is an impossible promise because of the way, this is probably a different episode, but like because of the way the Academy is instructed, if you want to actually be interdisciplinary and actually be successful as a faculty, as a faculty member in most universities, you essentially have to have two doctorates. Like you have to be a mm-hmm. specialist in both fields, but I think like I, I mean, I'm not so out there making charts, but I did a humanities dissertation on virtual reality and technology, and like learned some programming as a, on the side because I'm like this seems important, so I understand. But basically, like I need to understand at least a baseline of technology in order to talk about effectively, and even that, like, but to me is like low level interdisciplinarity. People look at it be cross eyed because I think that there's mm-hmm. this expectation that like, which I, I mean. I think there's this expectation when it, when, when you say that you're interdisciplinary, it means that you have the same kind of specialty in every area you're writing about as someone who is an inter- interdisciplinary scholar, which I think is mm-hmm. kind of a goofy way of looking at it. It's like, no, this is a different perspective on research than someone who's like special, hyper specialized in one area, which isn't a judgment. It's not that one is worse than the other. 
or one is inferior to the other. It's like one, in my mind, it's a difference between like one is a, is a practice of synthesis with interdisciplinarity, trying to like take knowledge from multiple fields and kind of build a narrative around it, build like what, it, what happens when you put these in the conversation versus I'm going to be hyper focused on this specific area so that I can be as detailed as at like, uh, and as knowledgeable on this, this subdomain as I possibly can. Because and I, and I think ultimately like both of those practices like require one another to function. It just happens to be that one fits into the structure of the academy but of the other. Welcome to my TED Talk. Different episodes. <laughs> so, that was good. It's, it's really interesting because uh, that company, Math and I both worked for Maya Design way back when, um, mm-hmm. was, was started by three academics who came from different formal disciplines within Carnegie Mellon. Mm-hmm. And I think they were dissatisfied I, in, in some ways by the quality of work that they could do within mm-hmm. that structure. Mm-hmm. Like, and so they created a commercial entity, a company, right, where they could control the structure. And they really, like, like we pushed interdisciplinary work extremely hard in our, uh, in our marketing and our advertising. Mm-hmm. Sometimes when it wasn't even necessary, to be fair. Like, yes, it, it was yes. just, when, it was just, that was our, that was our gimmick, right? Someone might oh. hire us for something that was really a programming job, but we wanted to prove a point. So we would make mm-hmm. it a, a programming visual design humanities project because we were yeah. proving a point. Well, that, that's definitely true. But, uh, mm-hmm. but I also think that, uh, they were kind of right. And, mm-hmm. and, and I think that a lot of creativity comes from the collision of different ideas, mm-hmm. right? Which, mm-hmm. which means it's, it's hard to do in a hyper specialized environment because you're kind of off on your own or you're with people who are kind of a lot like you mm-hmm. in their interests and their focus areas. Areas. And it's easier to do this stuff if you think about the team or the group as the primary entity, as opposed to the individual. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not sure, I don't know that the corporate world is better at this overall than oh, academia. Yes. I doubt it is. I think the corporate world might be a little more flexible. So there might be pockets <laughs> where it's better. I don't know. I buy that. And, and so here, and, and this is, I mean, I'll, I'll tie it back together with charts again. <laughs> well, no, I think we are wrapping back in, into it. I think there are two corporate worlds. Mike has been lucky enough to, for the most part, only work in the good one. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and Mike, Mike will agree that Mike's, I mean, Mike's worked for three different companies, but effectively you've had one job since you graduated from college. It just kind of your job. And, and they all came from academia too, right? Well, the company we worked yeah. for was spun out of academia and then Mike spun. So that's kind of a And mixture. then Mike spun his job at that company off into a new company. And then that company got sold. So you've worked for three different places, but it's all still you're being hot, like, like they're all, there's a clear line from one to another. It's not like you applied for another job, right? Yeah. Th- yeah. My, my, my career goal is to never interview. I don't ever want to have to <laughs> go through the interview process. It's terrifying. Yes. It's, 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 a, it's a lot easier to just start a company and sell the company than to have to do that like whiteboard coding exercise. Who wants to do that? Yeah. Right. So, yeah, so, so, that's so, where I'm at right now. Right. And, and so, <laughs> right. But so he's been, but he got, Lucky in that again, you know, neither of us work there anymore, but like we do believe in the principles that were instilled on us in that, at that company, right? Which was specifically trying to do an interdisciplinary thing. Yeah, you were psychology, math, and what were you? Well, the three founders were a psychologist, a computer programmer, computer. and a visual designer. But like the people who work there were massively varied in background, right? And they were specifically trying to do a thing, which is why we had these projects that did this. Whereas I've worked other places in the corporate world, which work much more like what the academia does, which is we are, I'm I'm not going to diss companies that I've worked for, but I worked for one company that very much hated visual design and we made software for a living and they're like well no people should like us because we have the best algorithm and i would get very upset because no one can see the algorithm and my boss would be like but it's the best and i'd be like i know but like so we had no we had no visual design we had no user interface the user interface for our product was um was that you 
um, took all your data and you typed it into an Excel spreadsheet and then you fed the spreadsheet to the algorithm. And that's how, that's how we ran our, our software. And he didn't need a visualization. Uh, so it was like, well, how do you, how do you read this chart? And it's like, well, you hire a computer scientist or a mathematician to read the results to you and tell you what they mean. And this was their mentality. So this is the exact opposite. The, like from their world, everything is math, right? Like we don't need visual design. We don't need interface design. We don't need psychology. Math is the only thing that matters. So it's the exact opposite of, of where the good company was. Um, and then there's anything in between, right? And I think what happens in the places that like Andrew and Katya are talking about is I think creating a chart, right? Um, so Steph, you say you're going to, if you're doing data, you're going to do statistical analysis on it. You're going to sit there and you're going to crunch every number from, from a five year study and try. So, and well, typically, I guess I'm different from what Mike does in that we generally have like a, a hypothesis and we test that. That's mm -hmm. through. So we're kind of like driven by that rather than bottom up. Right. So, but, yeah. but you're still, but you're still crunching all, all of the data, right? And the chart, the in chart doesn't have to be all that pretty. It just has to be pretty enough. No, good enough to be understandable. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, we're, and we're, APA format. Right. <laughs> Whereas like in the, in the humanities, a lot of what we do, and I think Andrew, she'll definitely agree with this because like, even though you have people pushing back against you and saying you shouldn't be using analytic data, what you're trying to prove is you're trying to prove it's useful and prove it's academically rigorous, right? Like, like it's a trick, right? Like we, we put a, we toss a chart on there. It's a bar chart because look, I've done some real work. CCC. Mm -hmm. That's like, that's essentially it's sleight of hand. And what's odd is you never have. The humanities person, I mean, I shouldn't say never, but this is why our bosses at, at our former company were frustrated because in both of those situations, the statistics person who is working like Steph and the humanities person who is working like Andrew, both of you should have hired a visual designer to make a good chart. Like that would have been the smart thing to do. And it never happens. There's never that, you know, like, like Kathy said, it's interdisciplinary is sort of, you know, a buzzword. No one ever does it. And I, and I wonder if that's sort of, problem, right? Because charts do have multiple purposes. There's a research purpose. There's a very human driven like interaction purpose, but there's also an aesthetic purpose mm -hmm. and and they don't really cross over as much as they should. That also makes me wonder, I think the observation that like I won't go with maybe the corporate world, we'll go with the non academic world might be sure. Maybe at least a little bit more open, if not always better to some of that, because I think like what I'm thinking about. So, you know, I work in right now in product design. So we're, I think in some ways, like interdisciplinarity is like more accepted, even if we don't use the terms, just because like, you know, when you're explaining something to a, like a client, you have to do all of those things. Like you have, you have to think about visual presentation and aesthetics. You have to make a presentation appealing. You have to, but it also has to be founded in data because it can't just be like made up coming out of nowhere. And it needs to have that rhetorical component because you're ultimately trying to convince whatever stakeholder you're talking to. So like, mm -hmm. even if we're not necessarily talking about like, oh, we do interdisciplinary work because like, it's a buzzword in, you know, in product design in the same way it is in academia. I think it's like, there's, there's an understanding that when you're working, especially on teams or across teams, you kind of need to do all of those things, especially with those teams like, I'm, you know, I'm like liaising between an engineering team versus a creative team versus a research team and trying to get them to all speak the same language. That's inherently interdisciplinary. I wonder if that's kind of where there's, there's at least like the potential for there to be more, more flexibility is just because it's like the world is interdisciplinary in a way that the academy is not always mandated to be, or at least we don't always acknowledge because we do. There is this like fetishized thing around expertise and the idea that if you're an expert, you can only be an expert in one thing, which like in practice, even people I, I know that are like hyper specialized in whatever their, their discipline is aren't experts on just one thing. Right. Like in order to understand any subject, you have to develop expertise on multiple methods, multiple subject areas. Like even if there's one place that you're the strongest in, it's not just mm -hmm. like, you know, you could research bananas for the rest of your life. And the only thing you know about is bananas. So you have to know about, I don't know why bananas is coming to mind, but that's just what's happening. Uh, but you <laughs> have to know about the methods to research bananas. You have to know about how to communicate the methods. <laughs> like what's important about bananas. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's very true. And uh, it kind of reminds me, uh, <laughs> my my dad told me something when I was a kid. He he sort of had a very, um, you know, you just made fun of me now because like I've had basically the same job for the past <laughs> 20 years, which is, <laughs> you know, kind of, 
fucking dream, dude. That's like, an accomplishment. I want that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 uh, yeah, it's been. I I I agree with you. I'm very lucky. Uh, but but my dad had a lot of jobs, right? He was uh, he was uh, a vice president in the cable TV business. He was general manager of an AM radio station. He taught broadcast journalism at a community college. He was the IT director for like the uh, health and human services department of the state of Florida. Like lots of stuff that like it sounds like completely different stuff like why Mm -hmm. like how did you go from this to this to this to this and he told me once that really his his core skill like the thing that he was good at that like set him apart was he could talk to the technical people and he could talk to the business people he could talk to the engineers and he could talk to the sales guys right and he could translate for them and if you can do that and do it well, you're always going to have a job in the corporate world because they have to, like, you have to do it, right? Like, it's not optional, just like how you said, like, you know, you have to do that. And that's like, um, if you do like agile software development, um, there's a role called the product owner, mm-hmm. right? And the, the product owner's whole job is to integrate all the different stakeholders, like the technical requirements and the sales requirements and the business, this and that, and pull all that stuff together. And they can't afford to be an expert in probably any of it, right? Because like, you, because you can't, be. but they have to know enough to collaborate effectively with all of those different people. I, I've, I've had CTO roles and tech lead roles and strategy roles and all of that stuff. But the common denominator is, again, you have to be able to communicate with a lot of different people. And to try to bring it back to uh, charts, um, charts are a great way to communicate with people. Mm-hmm. They enhance your ability to communicate technical quantitative data, even if your audience is not an expert in that arena. And mm-hmm. so it's, you know, super valuable to be able to do that effectively. And I think if you've decided that you're not going to, for some reason, you're only hurting yourself and your organization, right? Like you're, you're basically saying, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm going to build a table, but I've decided for fun not to use a saw or a hammer. <laughs> I, I'm like, like I'm going to make it extra challenging for myself, right? Mm-hmm. Like I'm just going to leave tools on the table and not even pick them up. Yeah. Which, I mean, to be fair, I mean, we, you even said it, part of our not liking pie chart, the snobbery, right? Like if the main goal is just basic communication of the simplest form of an idea, because one thing that I know all of us will agree on is, you know, what we want out of a good chart that has that's for public consumption is we want the simplest, easiest to read chart. We're trying to simplify a 30 page paper into something that gets people's eyeballs on it. And they say, oh, OK, I understand it. There is more coronavirus here than there is here because this dot is bigger, right? <laughs> like that's that's what you're really trying to get. If 80% of coronavirus is here, 20% here, pie chart's great at that, right? So that's those tools, right? Like you're just trying, like at some level, you're trying to communicate a complicated idea. Now, in reality, the idea of 80% of coronavirus is in place A and 20% is in place B, the world is not that simple. And it is probably much more complicated than that. And that's why you're supposed to read the 30 page paper. Not everybody's going to read the 30 page paper. So you need to be able to communicate the most important piece of this. Mm-hmm. The, you know, coronavirus bad, wear mask. You know, like that's what you're looking for, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. I have a question being not as, not as expert as in charts as, as everyone literally on this call. I think. A, what Matt is talking about, I think is, is interesting, especially in light of like thinking about the example you were talking about earlier of like people like misusing charts for, uh, about like say police brutality. I think it was one of the examples you brought up. Yeah. Like, yeah. is there a way, if, if you accept for the moment that a certain amount of the population is not going to read the whole thing and they're just going to get their news from headlines because we live in the meme, the meme verse. Mm-hmm. But like, is there a way to make a chart that in some way acknowledges I guess like the ambiguity of data or like the, uh, basically what we're talking about, like the distortion or the, the subjectivity inherent in, in, in representing data. Yes. Uh, though 
it's super hard because there's actually a lot of different kinds of ambiguity and uncertainty, gotcha. right? Like, so, um, so if you're talking about quantitative uncertainty, right? And Steph can probably speak to this more authoritatively than I can, right? But you'll do a linear regression, right? Mm -hmm. And the linear regression is going to have, you know, error bars on it. And you can say, look, uh, this variable accounts for, you know, this much of the predictive power. And you can say, you know, it's plus or minus whatever. It's kind of like the confidence intervals that you would get when you're doing uh, polling, right? Mm -hmm. Which you've probably seen a million times because we have just had a, an election and there have been a billion polls. Uh, so, you know, that kind of stuff you can visualize directly with stuff like box and whisker charts, or instead of drawing a line on the chart, you make the chart kind of fuzzy and it, you extrude that line a little bit and, and, and use opacity and shading to kind of smear it out. Um, so you can do that kind of thing, right? But then there's the deeper kinds of ambiguity where it may be unclear what even are the right things to talk about and the right things to present mm -hmm. in the in in the chart itself. Uh, you know, I think earlier we had the example of gender representation, and, and, and you know, maybe you want to count the number of lines spoken by women in a particular script for a movie or something like that, but. Even that, there's lots and lots of questions if you dig into that. Like, are you talking about the representation of the character as a woman? Or are you talking about the identity of the uh, person who plays the character? Like, Bart Simpson is a boy on The Simpsons, but I'm pretty sure he's voiced by, yeah, a, he's woman, by a woman, right? So, mm -hmm. like, so which way do you count that? If you have right. a character with, uh, if you have a, a character or an actor with a more complex gender identity, Mm -hmm. right? Like, do you just lump them in, like, it, like, uh, or do you split it out into all the gender identities? Like, how do you do that? Yeah, so, or, or, yeah. or the way you operationalize a specific variable. Like, if you're yeah. looking at the, like, I don't know how much like attention or how much, um, what's what's the word for, like, how much of a presence a like men versus women have on screen? How do you measure that? Do you measure it just by number of words? Do you measure it by screen time? Do you measure it by like how centered they are in the frame? There's all kinds of ways that you can choose to right. measure that, and you can like choose to present the specific operationalized variable that shows that proves like what you want to prove well, too. And that's all quantitative. None of that's qualitative, right? Right. Like, I can I make a film that features women heavily that might not be what you want representationally. The vast majority of pornography features far more women than men, but mm -hmm. that's yep. not what people are looking for when they're talking about female representation in film. Right. I and mean, well, they're gonna, I'm not even trying to diss pornography. I'm just saying that that's, right. it's, it's a substantively different question, but certainly there are more women on screen than men. Right. And are you transparent? And do you report mm -hmm. that when you're reporting your data? Mm -hmm. Well, and, it's, it's, and, and I don't know. Well, it's because it's like there's like the, the quantitative aspect of it, which is basically like, is there gender representation and what does that look like? And then there's the quantitative, like the qualitative aspect of that. of like, what is the quality and nature of that representation? Which, right. I mean, like, I'm, I'm sure there's a way to represent that in charts that someone, that someone's aware of. But like, in order to get to that level of nuance, you have to read the 36 page paper. And maybe you should, but I mean, like, you can chart very specific qualitative var variables. Sure. But again, you don't want to make the chart too complex, right? Like you could, you could do a chart that does male gaze issues, right? If you came up with a quantitative way to measure it, or you could take the very simplistic Bechtel test, right? You can put a Bechtel test on a chart mm -hmm. and end up with misleading data, but data that can get a conversation started. Yeah, in general, I would say that it's best to report as comprehensive data. Usually when we're trying to decide, should I pick this measure of learning, this measure of learning, this measure of learning, we often try to come up with a way to make composite of that that represents all of that to compare it. Because that's cherry picking of data is like one huge problem in misinterpreting results. And like there have been, there's a... um a paper that won an award at, I think, AERA. Uh, it, there was a, a lawsuit against a school district who they accused of um, discriminating against black students. Mm -hmm. And the school district had data that they used to prove in quotes that they didn't do that. But then they uh, eventually the data was shared with uh, researchers and they found that they were actually like 
picking certain data from that. And when they looked at the full data set, that it actually did prove that there was uh, discrimination. So that's that's kind of another aspect of, it, mm-hmm. of presenting, like how, how you know whether yeah, you're, you're more basically higher quality, <laughs> more comprehensive data is the way to go in general. I think we're actually modeling accidentally <laughs> one of the ways that the the humanities do approach this right now which is called mixed methods research mm-hmm. methodology mm-hmm. so yeah you do the data but you also talk about it so exactly as Mav did mm-hmm. you can point out that the little mermaid doesn't have a lot of lines and then you can say like you know, mm-hmm. in an essay probably because she doesn't talk for most of the movie that's right. the premise of the movie so you've contextualized the data uh, and as a result of that you're combining the qualitative and the quantitative in order to create a holistic perspective that can get the best out of both uh, mm-hmm. and you don't just have to use the quantitative data as evidence. That's a huge misconception. You can use the quantitative data to build a context. You can use it to prompt further inquiry, as we've already talked about. Like It doesn't just have to be the, here, look, I've proven my point thing anymore. And the Bechdel test is a great example of that. Because as you said, the Bechdel test doesn't indicate quality representation of women. What it indicates is a lack of quality representation of women Mm -hmm. across a wide enough sample, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And that's a really big clue that, hey, something might be happening in this work of art that we're looking at with regards to the representation of women. So now that we know that there's, you know, an entry point, let's talk about the ways women are represented here. It's been Mm -hmm. flagged and the data can give you that flag. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a that's a hugely important point. I think that um, especially when you're speaking at scale, right, like if you're going to analyze the media industry or something like that. And you've got hundreds or thousands, tens of thousands of individuals and works of art and stuff like that to, to analyze and to discuss. You should start simple, right? Make your methodology Mm -hmm. very clear and very simple. It won't be perfect. There will be lots of edge cases you can point to where the methodology kind of gives the wrong answer, but in the aggregate overall, it'll be more robust. It'll be a lot easier to implement. It'll be a ton easier for people to understand. And then once you have an idea kind of at that gross level of what's going on, then you can develop more complex methodologies. You can drill down, you can dig in, and you can say things like, well, okay, I get it that on our metric, this particular program does badly when it should do well because of X, Y, and Z. But mm-hmm. that's okay because the simple metric is still reliable yes. most of the time. And I'm going to pick on the Bechdel test again, or reverse pick on it. I'm going to phrase it here, I guess. Um, that's where, <laughs> well, that's that's where it actually is good, right? Like the reason the Bechdel yeah. test is relevant is because as a metric for the entertainment industry as a whole, for the film industry as a whole, you can build a chart where you count number of female characters versus um, number of conversations not regarding men. And you can make a two dimensional, it's three dimensional because they have to be named female characters. But like you can make a second iteration. Yeah. Yeah. But you can make a chart that like that shows that and shows that there are, that it's a relatively small percentage of the overall industry. So it's great to be a conversation starter. It's great to be the thing that draws you into the 30 page paper, right? Mm -hmm. Where it fails is because of the way people use charts and use simple metrics and stuff sort of in the memified 21st century, you know, the world of the internet is people will go, well, this movie's not feminist because it fails the the Bechdel test. And it's not, uh, again, gravity, the film gravity fails the Bechdel test famously. It is a very feminist movie. It's a movie with one real character in it who is female, but it can't pass the Bechdel test because there are no other characters. Well, there's two. There's a male character okay. in half the movie. And, but like, there's only two characters in the movie. There's a third character. He dies in the first 15 seconds. And then for the rest of the movie, the, and I'm sorry, spoiler for a movie that's like decades old, but one character dies in the first 15 seconds. And then for the rest of the movie, it's George Clooney and Sandra Bullock. And eventually just Sandra Bullock. She's the main character. And she's got no one else to talk to for most of the movie. Right. That's the point of the movie. So, you know, is she a strong yeah. female character? Absolutely. But where does she end up on the chart? 
she ends up in the chart on the negative Bechdel test part. Mm-hmm. But that's fine if you're looking at a trend across all movies because she's just an outlier. She's a weird, she's a weird noise in the trend that will mm-hmm. look across 10,000 movies. She doesn't matter, right? So, but people use charts wrong, right? So, it's even, yeah. Well, to your point that people use charts wrong, it's even fine to see those outliers on the chart, right? Because, like, that gives mm-hmm. you something to dig into, right? You, 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 like, you do your scatter plot, and what you're expecting is to see everything clustered along a nice line, like, a uh, diagonal line that goes from the bottom left-hand corner to the top right-hand corner. But then you see a bunch of stuff in that upper left quadrant and in that lower right quadrant, and you see a clump or a cluster, and you say to yourself, oh, that's weird. We should look at that, right? right. Like, yeah. and that's, that's so valuable. You, you, want, mm-hmm. you, you want to see that. The thing that, uh, the, the other thing people do that's in, annoying, right? Like, <laughs> is, uh, in, instead of saying the Bechtel test proves that gravity is not feminist, they do the opposite and say gravity proves that the Bechtel test is useless and we right. should abandon it, right? Like, no. Right. <laughs> that's not how tools work. Well, it's, it's, like, exactly. right. it's like it's, it's like a, ha- a hammer is useful until you need a screwdriver. Like these things. Are no. Same. Right. Exactly. Well, and I think that like the importance of like the cluster indicating like basically like the cluster of outliers basically like oh this is this is an area for future research. Like, I think that goes back to like Andrew's point about mixed me- like mixed methods and the ways different ways you can use data. It's like that's an indication of like oh there's a research project here somewhere. We should look into this mm-hmm. and. You know, and maybe what's to, in order to explain why that outlier is happening. I mean, I think Matt has illustrated this. Like, to explain why gravity is an outlier, you have to get to the narrative explanation. Like, the best way to explain that might not be like a visualization because you need to dig deeper into what it is. And then it becomes that, like, the interplay of quantitative and qualitative explanation. Mm-hmm. Which is what makes for interesting papers, right? And it's that people fun. Don't read. Everyone, I, 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 everyone <laughs> just needs to get over themselves and hang out with people from other disciplines and just acknowledge that everyone's work is freaking cool and yeah. be okay with and it. Read. Reading and good. read. I think if there is one thing we resolve today, it is that people need to read more damn. Like, just please read. <laughs> please. Read more than the headlines. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we touched on it briefly, but there is misrepresentation of that. Now, now there's certain there's certain things that are just like outright lies, like the chart that I was talking about, where ninety seven percent of white people that's, don't care about yeah, that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's step just, number one. That's not that's not true. Let's check your data. Someone just made a chart that said that. And I'm like, yep. Pro tip: okay, if there's no citation to a reputable source, it's probably um, made yeah. up garbage, guys. And if there is a citation to a reputable check source, it out. check this reputable. The amount, they re- the amount, I realize the FBI, like the amount of like headlines and also charts that I have seen that are just like reference, like very good data actually, but the act, whatever they've explained, has nothing to do with the data. I have a, I have a certain person in my that's what I was going to get larger you because familial <laughs> structure that I will not name that has shared some of those things, and I'm sure it's one of those things. Like I'm sure it's like. It's a combination of like probably read the headline, didn't dig into it. And I think also like a lot of it is we don't necessarily all have the literacy required, both when it's coming to looking at charts and looking at data representations, as well as evaluating sources. Like, yeah, I didn't realize that a different person actually wrote that writes the headlines than mm-hmm. writes the actual article. Depends uh, on where, but yes, frequently. Okay, mm-hmm. that's what- it depends on the news source. But some uh, there's uh, sometimes an author will, will title their own work. Sometimes there's a copywriter who does it. I guess usually when I see an article on Facebook, it's designed to be clickbaity, and yes. yeah, especially if it's been shared, sort of, you know, <laughs> by definition, it's it's clickbaity. Yeah, um, there are. I mean, I mean, peek behind the curtains at Vox Podcast, but probably I title more of our blogs. Like we all sort of write an equal amount of blogs, but usually I write the titles. It's because my, I mean, are, my titles are famously boring because I try and be. <laughs> Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I'm trying, and I mean, I'm, I'm literally trying to trick you into reading our, and listening yeah. to our show. So that's different episodes, but so SEO, that's SEO, that's that's like, yeah. SEO is very useful. SEO is also, I am convinced, contributing to the dumbing down of the internet. Right. And, 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 and I'm sorry, but you know, but still subscribe to us on iTunes or Stitcher. See, we're tricking people into having intellectual conversations. So hopefully oh. it evens out. <laughs> but yeah, but, it, but it, in addition to the, you know, to the, to the just plain out, flat out, We've lied, and again, sometimes people will cite stuff, and I've seen lots of charts where, like, according to Quinnipiac, and I'm like, 
I read Quinnipiac and it didn't say that. Like literally, yeah. there's a, oh, or, yeah. or or famously, I mean, famously for somebody who I don't like. We, you know, there's that meme that goes around where well, Donald Trump said in a Time magazine interview that if he ever ran for president, he'd do as a Republican because Republicans were stupid. He never said that. He said a lot of horrible stuff in, in Time magazine interviews. Not that. Mm-hmm. That's just made up. But somebody, but somebody cites it as you know January 1987. No, not, it's not true. Um, if, if it fits so, somebody's, if it fits somebody's existing narrative of what they believe about the world, they're less likely right. to go look at it. Confirmation bias, right? But I don't want to make him look too good, so I will use him as my bad example too, um, because this recently came up with somebody I was sort of trying to argue with, explain things to, where people were like, "Well, I don't understand why black people hate Donald Trump because you know he did more for black employment than anybody, any other president ever," and that's not really. And they showed me a chart. Not really true. That's something he says. Now, what is true is that the black unemployment level was lower during Donald Trump than any other president in the history of since we've been scheduling it. That's true. But the raise during Trump's presidency was lower than the, than the raise during Obama's presidency. So, you know, the, the, the differential was much bigger and it crested in Trump's first year. So theoretically, the highest point ever he has it. But uh, and 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 I was trying to and I was trying to explain it to the guy and I was like, okay, think of it this way: if you're watching football stats and you have a guy who throws a 50 yard touchdown to a guy who catches the ball on the one yard line and gets tackled into the end zone, and you have a guy who throws a 50 yard touchdown that he threw five yards, and then the guy ran 45 yards, evaded 15 tackles, and made it into the end zone by himself. Those both just show up as 50 yards, right? But like as a 50 yard reception for a touchdown. But the, but the cooler guy is the one who ran 45. <laughs> and mm-hmm. people miss that because no one, no one looks at all the stats. They only look at the big number. And, and so you can have misleading data that Trump's people, I don't know if Trump's even smart enough to understand it, but Trump's people certainly use that stat to their advantage a lot. During his presidency, even after it was no longer true because there was a pandemic, that everybody in the country lost their jobs regardless. But they used that stat constantly because it was a feather and you could make a misleading chart out of it. Yeah. And it's a broader statistics thing as well, too. Yeah. Like my kid asks me, what's the fastest animal? And everybody says cheetah. cheetah. No. Or what distance? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? A cheetah can do a sprint, but then it'll die if you try to run them up. <laughs> It's a These are mm-hmm. Exactly. And that's again where like a mixed methods thing can become really important. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are there are many there are many microscopic animals that are super fast, but their entire mm-hmm. lifespan is lived in like a you know six foot radius. You know? like, like my, favorite, <laughs> my favorite articles recently is like the there's like a very small like sand cat that's basically like half the size of a domestic short hair that's apparently the world's mm-hmm. deadliest animal. Because it, it, I oh, guess by volume, I, yeah. Because it kills lots of tiny things. <laughs> I, like, I love the idea that a small, adorable thing is the world's biggest mass murder. It just, you know, it brings me some kind of demented and upsetting joy. Yeah. Well, and, and I, well, but see, and those are those are always like the fun charts for stuff like you know, pound for pound, the deadliest fighter of all time, and you know, it probably. And probably it's like some six year old girl in like uh, a kid's karate division because mm-hmm. pound for pound, she's, you know, got a better record than say Mike Tyson, mm-hmm. right? Because it's like the, she's six and tiny. I went, <laughs> you know? I went to a rock climbing competition that was exactly that because like there was a mm-hmm. literally like nationally ranked men's uh, rock climber that was like go- going to this like neighborhood regional competition that like he was probably, you know, overqualified for. Because it happened to be in his neighborhood, and he was they they do this like ceremonial thing at the end, where it's just like a fun a fun like basically climbing competition against the people who like won the men's division, the women's division, and then the the, the kids and teens division. You know, the seven year old kid beat the pants off of these like very good rock climbers <laughs> because because like the str- strength weight ratio is insane. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah she's like, I mean, cause, I mean, obviously, who can bench press more? The grown man. But like the differential right. between like a, a super in shape seven year old is massive, right? They're superhuman if you 
actually multiplied it out and and you can do stuff like that and then you see um there's a place that i th- used to have bookmark that has you know interesting chart correlations where you can just put in you could put in a random variable and find something that is randomly just happens to be correlated to it with no causation whatsoever it will be like you know us gross domestic product happens to be correlated with you know um shoe size in africa over this 10 year period. No reason. It just magically happened to be to, to, to show up that way. But you can always prove, you know, prove in scare quotes things that seem really fanciful by having correlated data oh. that doesn't really work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Matt, I thought where you were going with that was I wondered, like, there are certain pretty common bad visualization techniques that create the visual impression of wrongness in the data even though the data isn't actually wrong. Like um, like a really common example that we've probably all seen 100,000 times over the past year is you'll see a map that is showing uh, Republican and Democratic voting, right, for the mm-hmm. country. Mm-hmm. And it will look bright red, right, because, you, you know, there will be little bits of blue here and there and huge swaths of red area. And the natural... Because the entire are, population of Wyoming is seven. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The natural, the natural conclusion is, wow, the United States of America is a very conservative, very Republican country. And actually, it's the opposite, right? Like, we're more Democratic than we are Republican. But those, your brain integrates those colors over the area of the map. And the area of the map, of course, is correlated with land area, not mm-hmm. population. Mm-hmm. So it vastly overemphasizes the state of Wyoming relative to, say, the county of Los Angeles, even though the county of Los Angeles has a zillion more people than the yeah. state of Wyoming, right. right? Like, And this happens all the time. A, a similar yeah. She was uh, in bar charts. People often clip the zero value off the bar chart and just scale it to the uh, the points that are actually displayed in the bar chart. So the x-axis is very narrow, and then it will look like one bar is twice as tall as another bar yeah. when, in fact, they're actually very close together. That's why you need the error bars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, well yeah. or at least a properly scaled x-axis, uh, y-axis, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Like, or they show things in logarithmic scale that you it know, shouldn't be. <laughs> yeah, or, or I would think I would think color would also be something that could affect your interpretation of mm-hmm. data. Like in your example, Mike, yeah. with the uh, showing that Republicans, like the image that Republicans have more, you know, just the fact that they're red, I would think adds to that <laughs> that problem with the relationship between area. And, red always looks more important yeah. than any other thing. That that is a visual design tip. And it makes sure. <laughs> <laughs> so color color is a whole we could have a whole podcast on color but you should invite somebody uh who's more of an expert than you <laughs> yeah I, I do know that <laughs> that red does elicit like feelings of aggression and like if your team is red you're more likely to win a game given that you're similar uh similarly skilled and do you, do you know if that's culturally driven though Steph? no i think it's it's universal um i think it's just people from the researchers that I've heard talk about this, who actually study this sort of thing, they say that it's it's actually sort of it's it's innate. Well, they this is their they claim it's innate because it, it's the color of blood, and you're just sort of naturally repulsed by that color. But also somehow you're also att- more attracted to people that wear that color. I don't really understand the the logic, the complete logic, but that's what I've heard people say. Yeah, I believe it can be culturally affected as well. Yeah. There was a study that talked about um, that red thing not working in like one city because the city's soccer team wore blue. Well, and like, there's, like there's, I forget the contract off of my head, but there's, uh, there's like a, a national tradition where like, I mean, in, in most of the Western world, uh, like wedding dresses are traditionally white or some variant thereof, and there, but there are parts of the world where red is actually more common. And so I wonder, like, mm-hmm. I mean, there are, I mean, this is this is like a general sociological thing that we talk about in humanities in terms of like cultural meaning, like where there are things that seem to be innate tendencies across cultures, but once you add on top of that, cultural tendencies and like learned behaviors aren't necessarily mm-hmm. consistent across different populations. So I wonder if color is one of those things where it's like a little bit of both, where we have like an innate response. But then, in, depending on the cultural context 
and particularly I would imagine with this situation, I think that sports is a really good example. Like mm-hmm. the specific response might be like moderated by what we've learned. It's really fascinating. We should do an episode on color. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, well, and also just I think sampling, just because I think that's it. Got towards the end of that into like, you know, what I call ethnographic bias, right? Like you, like if you do your sample only on sports, your assumption might be that it's universal, but it might be a sport thing that is universal across cultures right. that is not, you know, or what do you consider a sport? There's all kinds of, mm-hmm. there's all kinds of weird um, sampling. You know, I'm super into just because of my research, I'm super into like anthropological mm-hmm. ideas of sex and gender mm-hmm. that we know over the last decade or two that we've made ridiculously stupid assumptions based on our last <laughs> couple thousand years of anthropology, based on the fact that like literally applied modern sociological, heavily Christian, heavily male, heavily white assumptions to all of history and can came up with com- with confirming results that like weren't accurate. And we just know that they're not accurate. Like if you just completely ignore a couple of things, like we just now read all these old studies completely differently, but mm. a different stu- a different topic. So we've resolved we've resolved nothing other than uh, read things, <laughs> read things, <laughs> ask <laughs> questions, and then read things again. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, read things. No, read things again is like the best advice. We it's such a. I mean, that's that's what crazy. Yeah, thing is. and don't just start. Don't just stop at the chart. Like charts, I think are great because they grab your attention. If you see something that's interesting, I mean, even if you're not doing the research, like Mike's thing about the scatter plot, if you see a chart that gives you an interesting, you know, that makes you go, "Oh, that looks neat." Let me look into that. Actually, look into it. Don't just. I mean, sure, forward it on Facebook if you want, but like. I, I've learned so much about uh, from random stuff. Like, um, I, I made this point, like, um, you know who has amazing chart visualizations? Um, two companies. Uh, I don't know if they do it anymore, but like they, they used to. Pornhub used to publish a blog where they just like visualize data from their, from their searches that was like massively fascinating of just what fetishes are people into in random states or random places in the world that like, it's not sexy, sexy, but it was just really interesting to look at data trends. And then the other one that did it was the the dating site, OkCupid. Okay they used to publish stuff like that. They they wrote a book. Did you read their book? Yeah, I um, I never read it, but I should get it. It's yeah, uh, it's, it's it's pretty good, but also really depressing. <laughs> oh, why? Well, it's just it's, well, it's, from right. a data science perspective. Just let me say this: if you are uh, if you are a black woman on a dating site, oh, oh, it's hmm. not good, and hmm. it's just it's just like in case you wondered if there was racism in the world. Yes. I don't know. Maybe you were wondering. Uh, no. Yes, no. there's there's significant data to support that claim. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that part of the but they discovered that through just analysis of their own data mining, mm-hmm. which is just really fascinating. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, is good that you get out of this. But again, they wrote a whole book about it and they've published several papers on it. They didn't stop with, here's a chart. Just look at this and be done. And I think so much of us do. So Because charts you know, are the basis say. of critical thinking, not the end goal of it. Right. Right. So so do some do research, research it twice. Read everything you can, and then reading, and good. then leave a comment on Vox, on Vox podcast. <laughs> and then we're gonna get an episode out of it, and then you're gonna come on as a guest. Oh, and, and the five star review, and right? the five star oh, review. We'll yeah, five star reviews. Come, you know, uh, like and subscribe on YouTube. Hit a bell. There's a bell now. I don't know. Yep. Uh, thank you, ABA and MLA citation formats. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is just getting weird. I want to thank our guests for joining. <laughs> Stephanie, thanks for coming back. Okay, thanks for having me. I enjoyed myself. Thank you. Stephanie, is there anything you'd like to plug? Um, well, no. See, uh, now see, last time Steph was on the show, she yelled at me. Well, I'm not asking her. Yeah, <laughs> it's just, just like you want to be invited to a party, even if you don't want to go. <laughs> Several movies that cover like you never assume what your partner is going to answer. <laughs> you always ask, even though you know the answer. I'm sure I saw that in a chart somewhere. Uh, Mike, what about you? Well, I guess I'll plug that inclusion analytics project again because I'm really <laughs> proud of it. I'll put a link uh, so people can see it in the show notes. I will say. I think we can improve our information visualizations, and I expect to in the coming year. And I'll also say that we are going to be hiring. Last year's work on this was really on a shoestring, and um, 
it's gotten really positive uh, feedback from the industry, which means we can invest in it. And so uh, we don't have those positions opened up quite yet, but we will soon. So if you want to work for a company that's doing cool media analysis uh, and working on these issues, uh, Nielsen's doing it. Uh, so give us a call. I, I might. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, it tur- turns out I, I, I do need a job. And I know a guy in that company. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, um, uh, Andrew. You can find my terrible charts at uh, Claremont Run on Twitter. Mm-hmm. And if you do a cross-reference search with Tidy Tuesday, which is a, a data viz kind of weekly competition thing, you can see really good data visualization experts making beautiful charts uh, out of our data and sort of cutting me out of it. Uh, <laughs> other than that, um, our data set is available on www.claremontrun.com. Uh, and if you want to read my work that comes out of that data, you can literally just Google me. Um, um, Andrew Demand, D-E-M-A-N. And you should find a bunch of stuff. Cough, cough. And you are the host of Cough, Cough. <laughs> oh, Cough, Cough. I, I am the host of a forthcoming podcast uh, on Excalibur called, um, oh, crap, I'm going to screw it up. Oh, gosh, oh, golly, oh, wow. It, yes, that's true, too. Yes. <laughs> we have a, Andrew and I have a new podcast that we starting in... <laughs> Two weeks as this show dro- or maybe a week. Damn it, I'm really horrible at this. But either ju- either is starting next week or is about to start because um, we've already recorded it in podcast time travel, which the listener knows I hate. Um, but yeah, we're going to be on a show together. But you also have another show. Yes, I have a podcast called Three Panel Contrast, mm-hmm. all in you know text form, no numbers in there, <laughs> um, which you can find on podcast places. Yep. That's also linked in the show notes. And Katya. Ah, uh, you can find me on the Instagram at just that nerd kid whenever I start posting. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, all of the places, always at Chris Maverick. You can follow the show in all those same places at Vox Popcast. You can also follow the show's blog at www.voxpopcast.com where we talk about whatever we're going to be talking about next week, which I believe next week for us is Bridgerton. <laughs> um, yes. Which, which, which should be fun. And then we've got some other cool ideas coming up. We're doing a um, show coming up for Valentine's Day with Andrew and my other co-host on that show, and Anna Papard, all about sex and superhero comics. That's going to be fun. Come on. You clearly have thoughts about that. So, you know, Go to the blog, find the post, give us your comments ahead of time so that we can talk about it on the show. We can work the things that you have to say into our comments on that particular episode. And you can find out what else we're going to be talking about. And if you enjoy the show, and we certainly hope you do, then subscribe to us on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify or wherever the hell else you get podcasts from. And do us a favor, subscribe to our new YouTube channel. Like and subscribe and hit the bell. I made a, I made a joke about that earlier, but you know, I don't really understand how YouTube works, but I know it's important to hit bells. Bells are important. I don't know. Um, the YouTube show has not only the audio content from this podcast, but visualizations and examples of the talking about you can follow along and we need subscribers there. And do us a favor, leave us a five star review on Apple Podcast or any other podcast service, but especially on Apple Podcast. That helps other people find the show, especially if you don't just leave us a five star rating, but you leave us a five star review that says a little something, something like here's a review that you can write today. I'm going to write it for you. You just say quirky little Marxist show charts are awesome. Just write that. Just write that down. At five stars. I want to see somebody write that and I'll, I'll, I'll announce it to you on the show if you really do. Anyway, that would, would really help us chart, out. How, proving that we are Quirky Little Marxist show, I would also appreciate that. That would be amazing. <laughs> the Quirky Little Marxist chart. Uh, I would like to thank Maximilian of Thought for Music for our epic theme song going ever so more epically and playing this out. I'd like to thank you for listening. I'd like to thank our guests for joining us. 